All right, folks, it's the game, the game, not just another game, the game, regardless of records, regardless of standings or rankings or championships on the line or not on the line. This one is special and there's rivalries uh, ensuing all over the country. It's rivalry week and they're all special in many ways, but uh, you can certainly bring a lot of intangibles, anecdotal evidence and tangibles to the board to bring uh, this one to the top of the list when it comes to college football rivalries and maybe sports rivalries. Ohio State, Michigan. We got Steve Hellwagon on the line from Bucknots 247 Sports and Kevin Noon. Glad to have you back, Kevin, from Rivals Buckeye Grove. How are you gentlemen doing today? Doing good. Doing great. So the college football season is a short one. Uh, it just seems like a few weeks ago we were talking FAU and getting the season started and what's it going to mean with Ryan Day in charge and uh, Justin Fields and so forth. And here we are just a few weeks later. And uh, it's unlike the NBA, Major League Baseball, even the NFL that seem to go on the entire year and basically take a few weeks off and then they come right back. Uh, it's college football and uh, it's a precious, precious limited time, both in regards to the games and the, uh, the period of the season. So here we are just uh, 12 games later. And uh, we know quite a bit about this football team. It's been dominant for the most part. Uh, I'll start with you, Steve, in regards to your assessment of the Penn State effort, just because you could spin that both ways. Uh, Penn State put on a flurry that was basically gifted to them, in my view, aside from the one substantial drive of 75 yards gifted to them by Ohio State. The Buckeyes then kind of put it to a halt, especially that second time around when they gave up the football and the defense said, you know, enough's enough, field goal, that's it. And then they took control back. Uh, but you can put the positive spin on that Ohio State dominated for 55 minutes of the game or that Penn State hung in the game and it was only 28-17. Well, I think that's what a competitive football game looks like. Uh, we had not seen anything quite like that for Ohio State uh, this season yet. I mean, the Wisconsin game was a three-point game early in the third quarter, and then Ohio State drove down and scored. Chase Young uh, created back-to-back -back turnovers, and Ohio State scored after that. Next thing you know, it goes from 10-7 to 7 to 31-7 to 7 in that game. In this case, the Avalanche kind of went the other direction. They got up 14 to nothing at halftime. Uh, it could have been 21 to nothing. They had the touchdown by Fields that was called back because of replay when it was determined that uh, the ball had been knocked out before he crossed the uh, the plane of the goal line. And so 14 to nothing, they drove down, scored to start the second half. It's 21 to nothing. And you think that this thing is completely in the bag. The defense, uh, as you said, gave up a 75-yard drive, uh, which uh, during the course of that, uh, I believe, is when uh, the quarterback uh, got knocked out and the other quarterback, uh, Will Levis, came in and finished that uh, drive. And then, uh, obviously, uh, it was uh, Dobbins and Fields losing fumbles on the next two possessions. And as you said, uh, Penn State got 10 points out of those. They could have tied the game, 21-21. to 21, But the defense got a great stop there to force a field goal in the, uh, the second one, 21-17. to 17. And it, it was a little uneasy there going to the fourth quarter at Ohio State. It was not in the bag. Uh, the Buckeyes even had to punt the ball away one time, and so Penn State had the ball with a chance to go ahead, but the Buckeyes eventually regained control. Uh, Justin Fields hit the big pass uh, over the top, uh, back shoulder pass rather to uh, Chris Olave for the touchdown, 28-17, to and then the defense uh, slammed the door on him three times there at the end with the Justin Hilliard interception, a couple sacks in there, one by Young, and uh, another by Browning, and the Buckeyes were able to get away with a 28-17 to win in a competitive football game. That's what it looks like, and Ryan Day talked about it last week, in a talent-equated game where both teams have four- and five-star players. Uh, that's what it looks like. And people will say, oh, Ohio State gifted it to them. Well, you know, Penn State also forced those fumbles. I mean, um, it wasn't like nobody was around and they just fumbled a snap and it went the other way. It was Penn State made plays on the football to knock it away. And, um, you know, Micah Parsons knocked one away from J.K. Dobbins. It's just the way that uh, football is. I mean, when you're when you got like athletes 
and strength on strength, that's what it looks like. So I didn't have a big problem with it. Uh, Ohio State got it out the win, and a huge win for them, their best win of the season, and uh, clinched the Big Ten Championship, and we can get into it a little bit more, just this dynamic, uh, clinch the championship game appearance, this dynamic that you know we're going next week uh, to play for the conference championship, and yet you've got this game in the middle here against Michigan, your rival, that doesn't have any impact on the Big Ten at all, but could actually uh, have impact in terms of the national championship picture, the playoff, and certainly with uh, bragging rights and recruiting uh, and everything else that goes along with uh, the rivalry. Ohio State's just dominated Michigan uh, for years that uh, now we're into this kind of uh, – it's a strange place we're in right now this, uh, this week, kind of a lame duck Michigan game that still means quite a bit. Steve, it's an important distinction that you make uh, on turnovers, and I try to analyze that myself when I see turnovers in a game, whether they were forced by the defense, good defensive play, because good defenses take the ball away, or just gifts in which you know the quarterback and the running back ran into each other and the ball was on the ground and the defense just happened to jump on it. Uh, Kevin, your thoughts on Penn State, because as I teed up for Steve, you can spin it a positive way or a negative way because Buckeye fans are now expecting Ohio State to beat everybody by 40, and they basically controlled the game statistically but had that flurry of mistakes which kept uh, Penn State in the game. Yeah, I mean, they held Penn State to 227 yards, 99 on the ground, a buck 28 in the air when uh, neither Sean Clifford nor Will Levis were particularly impressive in the air. Uh, Will Levis in a, a little bit of a different dynamic is much more of a bulldozing type of uh, running quarterback that it just it took Ohio State a little bit of time to adjust to. And yeah, I agree with Steve in saying that the uh, the turnovers were, were their takeaways. They were the Ohio State just didn't put the ball on the ground and say, here you go. Penn State took it away. But yeah, Ohio State definitely did dominate 55 minutes or so of that. And I think something else that's troubling too, it only committed There was the Thayer Munford uh, hold that really set them up on the field. Fields ends up getting sacked after that. They, in the final minute of the half, there's also a, I think it was like an illegal formation call, something along those lines that ended up leading to another Justin Fields sack. And then Ryan Day's like, all right, that's it. We're done. We're going to go to the locker room at that point. So you could sit there and say that a couple of penalties could have cost Ohio State 14 points uh, at that point. Plus the seven they left on the field with the field's uh, uh, fumble on the on the eight inch line, more or less, that went into the end zone for the touchback. So, I mean, if the ball bounces a couple different ways, we're talking about a 42 seven win or something. Ohio State hasn't been tested at that point. And, you know, fans may be a little bit happier, but we don't know as much about this team at that point, how they're going to respond to adversity, because I guarantee you nobody's going to go through 15 games without some adversity. So so best to face that now, getting ready to go into this stretch of potentially four games. We know we know what the next two are, Michigan and then the Big Ten championship game and then let, let the you know, let the chips fall where they may then. Hail to Harbaugh joining us in the live chat. So Michigan fans, you're welcome. Of course, we've got uh, 47 on the line right now. We appreciate everybody who joins us. Uh, this is a bit impromptu. We typically do this on Wednesday night, our Ohio State live show with Kevin Noon and Steve Hellwagon and others. Tony Girdman typically joins us and Claire Crawford, but we had to switch things up this week. So we appreciate everybody's uh, scheduling flexibility. Uh, so Kevin, we'll keep it with you in regards to this Michigan game. And Steve alluded to it on paper Let's say Ohio State, and we we will have no way of knowing this until all the games are played, gets the benefit of the doubt from the committee. They win a Big Ten championship game after losing to Michigan. The game's meaningless. Whoa, Ohio, Ohio State. Whoa, whoa. I, I know it's not meaningless. I Believe me, I, I grew up in this rivalry. I know it's not meaningless. Uh, but on paper, statistically, it could be in regards to standings and, and gunning for a championship. It could be meaningless from that aspect uh uh how do you feel about just the 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 situation we're in in ohio state possibly playing for a championship after the loss to michigan if that comes to that and uh just having to play three the three most difficult games potentially on the schedule at the back end of the schedule i believe that the big 10 schedulers should have enough brains to realize Ohio State's going to make the Big Ten title game 80% of the time. Therefore, we're lining them up with Penn State, Michigan, and the best team in the West three weeks three weeks in a row. 
Yeah, I, I, they, it's a Big Ten scheduling computer, and they say that it's agnostic. It doesn't know what's going on or whatever. Well, Ohio State certainly seems to have drawn some tough draws at, at certain points, and I don't know if it's a situation of where it's it, it puts in – historical data of who's won the most at that point and, and kind of staggers it against them a little bit, but it, it is, it is difficult. And, you know, you talk about the potential of this game, maybe not of the game, not having as much uh, importance in terms of making the college football playoff, but it's still darn important because Ohio state is still very alive for that number one seed and avoiding Clemson in the first round is of utmost importance. In my opinion, I, I wouldn't want to draw Clemson right now. I know that for a fact. So, you know, Ohio State certainly <laughs> needs to come out and, and take care of business there, and then obviously take care of business in Indianapolis. You know, I think it's where we are, not only with the, with the conference championship games, but with the college football playoff, that we have kind of uh, cheapened certain aspects of, of the schedule when you have teams that are sitting already in, the, in, the, in their conference championship game or whatnot with a game, two games, three games left on the schedule, kind of like Northwestern was last year. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's necessarily the best thing for the sport, but it's a world we live in at this point. But, you know, Ohio State certainly is not going to take this game lightly for a multitude of reasons. If, if, if nothing more other than it being the game, you know, try and get try and get that one. Try and get geographical preference if you can uh, and, and, and make it to that 15th game. Steve, somebody showed me a poll at some point this season where Ohio State fans were asked if you could beat Michigan and not go to the college football playoff, would you choose that scenario or losing to Michigan and making the college football playoff and still more fans would beat Michigan and not go to the playoff than vice versa? Yeah, I don't know. That's crazy. I think you set out each season to win the national championship in this day and age. And for some people, the notion of, uh, I guess it's become blase, I think, for a lot of people that just accept the fact that Ohio State's going to line up and beat Michigan. Um I know one of your questioners on there asked if they win this one and it becomes eight years in a row, is that some kind of record? Yes. For Ohio state, that would be some kind of record. Uh, they won seven in a row between 2004 and 2010. Although the 2010 win was vacated eventually. Um, they have won seven in a row free and clear under urban Meyer here the last seven years. And now Ryan day takes over and will try and become one and oh, and give them an eighth straight win uh, over Michigan, which is Ohio State's never, never done that. Uh, the previous record before the one in the last decade was four straight wins. So that'll give you an idea that uh, Michigan for decades and decades and decades has had the upper hand in this rivalry. I'm old enough to remember when they had like a 20 game lead in the overall series. And right now it's like seven or eight games because Ohio state's whittled it down. So you never take this for granted that Ohio state's just going to show up and beat Michigan. Uh, the last, some of the last several games have been very interesting. Uh, maybe not last year, 62 to 39, although it was a one or two point game at halftime. Uh, Ohio state just blew them out in the second half. Uh, you think about 2016, it was double overtime, I believe. Ohio State needed to pull out that game. It was number two versus number three. So anything can happen. Michigan's playing its best football of the season. Uh, the last four and a half games, I go back to halftime of the Penn State game when they were behind 21 to seven. Uh, they got it down to 28 to 21 and dropped a touchdown in the end zone that may have forced overtime. Otherwise, uh, maybe they'd be on a five-game run, and this game would be for the division championship. But uh, Ohio State, with a two-game lead with one game to play, has the Big Ten East all sewn up. And so, I don't know. I Again, I, national championship and a loss to Michigan or beat Michigan and don't care what else happens, man, I don't know. Um, <laughs> You know, you play Michigan every year. You've only got, what, uh, six consensus national championships uh, in the history of the program, eight total, including 61 and 70, which were kind of splinter championships. Um, that's a tough one. I would probably rather win the national championship, to be quite honest with you. But uh, I'm sure a lot of people out there would say that that's total blasphemy to, to say something like that. But uh, I don't know. Uh, I would have told you that at one point, Steve. There's no question about that. I've grown up a Buckeyes fan. I've been one for 42 years, as you guys 
have been as well. And the Michigan game is just, it is just beyond special. It's indescribable, but we're in a different era. This playoff has made things different. Uh, I grew up watching as you guys both have a, a lot of two and three loss Ohio state teams going up against two and three loss Michigan teams and it being a tie for a big 10 championship, or maybe somebody's going to go to the Rose bowl if somebody else loses and the Rose bowl just being the prize and beating Michigan and everything was wrapped up in the regular season. Now we've got this crazy playoff and Ohio state's reached an elite status in which they've just been able to maintain that where uh, this means a whole lot beyond uh, just beating Michigan and the big 10 and uh, it's a national program and uh, going to the playoffs and winning playoffs and national championships because the barometer is basically Alabama and Clemson and Georgia and those other schools and Ohio State's right there. And um, most Buckeyes have the pride of wanting to be the elite program, not just in the Big Ten, but in college football. And it's all about the playoff, Kevin. Yeah, it is all about the playoff. I mean, that's what we built. And that was always the fear of when we moved away from the bowl system. I mean, I understand that bowl games are still involved in the in it, but you know, it, it it's not just about winning your conference and going to the Rose Bowl. I mean, sure, Ohio State fans pack the Rose Bowl those times that Ohio State goes, but honestly, I mean, a lot of people were really disappointed that Ohio State went to the Rose Bowl last year and was left out of the college football playoff. And you know, that's the that's the time and the age that we live in. And you know, I'm here almost into my fifties and. The Rose Bowl is always going to be special to me. It also doesn't hurt that I grew up on the West Coast. So the Rose Bowl was always something that I watched even, you know, well before that. But, uh, you know, the, the, the onus now is getting to the playoff, getting into that four team situation of, and then going, getting through all the arguments of four, eight, you know, what should it be at that point? But, you know, I, I would never want to put myself into Sophie's choice of, you know, beat Michigan and not go to the playoff or, or, or the other way around. I mean, why can't they just, beat Michigan and go to the playoff. I, I, I don't know why we need to sit there and, and, and create these no-win situations. We we have a member of the beat who plays a this or that type of game with us, and I, I'm serious. I just want to jump off the roof of the building every time he does it with us because the, the choices are just about as, you know, as untenable as that. So, gentlemen, we've got a situation here where when we came into this game last year, Michigan was the better team on paper. I don't think there was any question about that, even though the records were the same. If you looked at common opponents, who did what against Michigan State and Nebraska and Maryland and on down the line, Michigan fared much better against those teams. They dominated those teams much more so than Ohio State, which struggled in a lot of those games, namely Nebraska and Maryland, of course. Uh, but then when it came down to it, on the field, Ohio State's elite talent and uh, the preparation by Urban Meyer and his staff were too much for Michigan once again. Now, here we've got a situation that's slightly different because Michigan was playing for all the marbles last year. Now they can be loose and fancy free and throw out the play, do whatever they want to because they've got really nothing to play for but to ruin Ohio State's season potentially. Uh, but we've got a Michigan team that seems to be coming of age and putting things together and playing much better football. How great should the concern be, Steve? And then, Kevin, you jump right on his back in regards to that Ohio State will lose this game to Michigan. I think Ohio State is clearly shown to be the best team out of these two and maybe the best team in the country, but Michigan certainly a top 10 to 12 team, uh, but they've played much better in recent weeks. Yeah, I think the concern is much greater today than it was a month ago. Um, I think that uh, you go back to that Wisconsin game, and I looked at it a little bit, uh, Wisconsin rushed for over 300 yards against Michigan, and Michigan only had 40 yards rushing in that game. Um, you know, I go back to the preseason. I wrote this for our first look column today. Uh, Michigan was ranked seventh in the preseason polls. They were fifth. Well, Ohio State was fifth <clears throat> nationally. A lot of the magazines like Phil Steele and some of the other magazines made their annual trendy pick that this was going to be their year, that this was the year for Michigan to win the East. And what I don't think people took into account <clears throat> was the lack of a running back. You had Higdon who left for the NFL. You had the other kid, Evans, who was suspended. So they didn't have a viable running back. It's taken them all year to kind of get that sussed out and figured out. Patterson, first half of the year, did not play like he was capable of playing. Donovan Peoples-Jones was injured. 
Uh, Bell came on kind of at midseason. And then over on defense, people were thinking, oh, it's the Michigan defense. Don Brown's calling the signals. Just throw the winged helmets out there, and uh, people are going to be held to 10 points a game, and here we go. You know, well, it doesn't work like that. You take Winovich, you take Bush, uh, uh, Rashawn Gary out of the mix, you know, three guys who different people thought would have been all American or all Big Ten guys, defensive player of the year caliber type guys. You take them out of the mix and it's going to be better. Um, it wasn't. And so it's taken them a half a season to calibrate, uh, develop and bring some people along. Uh, he came out Harbaugh at halftime when they're down 21 to seven at Penn State and said that this will be our finest hour. And he was trying to, you know, I, I don't know if he was trying to call a shot and say, hey, we're going to win this thing in the second half. But they doggone almost did. And from that moment on, they have played lights out. I mean, they blistered Notre Dame, who wanted no part of uh, playing them the following week in the rain. And then uh, here in the last few weeks, uh, Maryland. Uh, there was another game in there, and then uh, Indiana. This past week, Indiana had been playing pretty good football. It was a close game at halftime. And uh, Patterson, the last two weeks, has thrown for over 300 yards. So he's starting to get it together. Uh, Peoples-Jones is healthy, it seems. And uh, the defense is starting to come on and get stops and takeaways and make, and make plays. So this was the Michigan that we had all been sold a bill of goods on back in August. They're finally come to the party here on November the 25th. It's just too late. They can't win a, a Big Ten championship this year. Their drought is now 15 full seasons to 2004, which is the longest Big Ten championship drought in Michigan football history and counting, 15 years. And uh, so I don't know what, what else you can say other than they're going to be dangerous. This is their Super Bowl because where are they going to go? They're going to go maybe to the Orange Bowl or Cotton Bowl or Rose Bowl to replace Ohio State uh, or whoever, you know, whatever happens. I mean, and, and, and they're going to play another team ranked anywhere from 8th to 13th or 14th and probably a toss-up game. And who knows? This is their Super Bowl. This is it. So for those guys that have any kind of pride, I mean, and have had their nose rubbed in it, all these many years, it's time for them to stand up and be counted. And uh, certainly Jim Harbaugh, I mean, uh, oh, for against Ohio State, uh, he's going to go through an entire five-year cycle. And these are all his players. You know, no wins over Ohio State. In fact, really, other than the double overtime game, none of the games have been particularly close. So, I don't know. It, it, uh, it is what it is. I guess we'll, we'll see on uh, Saturday – if Michigan is going to back up all this talk that, hey, you know, we believe we can beat them, we're going to beat them, all this other stuff, and, and continue to play as they have here down the stretch, uh, to me, that's the challenge for Michigan. Hey, Kevin, before you take off on this, uh, just want to remind everyone, if you leave comments and questions, we'll respond to anything that warrants a response. Uh, this guy in particular, Tony Ger Gerd, Gerdman, um, he, he's, uh, commenting here in the live chat. Uh, maybe he knows something. I don't know. He's commenting that, uh, Ohio state, uh, has game changers in fields and young, who does Michigan have to counter? Of course, I'm speaking of Tony Gerdeman left a, a comment in the live chat, uh, right there. But, uh, Kevin, your thoughts about, uh, Michigan's improvement over the last several weeks and whether they pose a real threat. Well, we can sit there and we can look at their passing game and, and Shea Patterson's thrown for 384 against Michigan State and three what is it 366 against uh, Indiana, but they've also run for 83 yards against Michigan State and 87 yards against Indiana. A one-dimensional team is not going to win this game. It's just not going to happen. It won't. So unless they can figure something else, unless Zach Charbonnet or – or one of their other guys is able to, to figure out how to run the ball. I, I'm not I'm not overly concerned at that point. That you know I going up to Ann Arbor this series. I mean, I get it. I was a, I was an undergrad at Ohio State during two ten and one under John Cooper. I you know I I've seen crazy things happen. Uh, you know the better team not always winning the game and all those situations. But with but with that being said, I think that all of this talk of this renaissance resurgence of Michigan 
maybe a little overblown. I mean, and I'm going to, I'm going to piss off all the Notre Dame people. I, Notre Dame has been grossly overrated all year, every year. And, you know, so they, they come in and they, they, they knock the snot out of Notre Dame 45, 14, put up these huge numbers. And then, you know, Michigan goes through and plays the same schedule that everybody's cranking on Ohio state for playing that it, Oh, they ain't played nobody. When they coming out of Notre Dame, they played Maryland, Michigan State, and Indiana, three teams that Ohio State has played. Yeah, they are they are finding their passing game. They need to because they can't run the ball. Can't really protect the quarterback either. So, you know, I think the defense is coming along pretty well. They've done a good job of holding, you know, a hapless Michigan State team to 200 and something yards, low 200s. Indiana – they were a lot better with their other quarterback. Ohio State was able to avoid the one quarterback as well, too. You know, they threw for 224. They ran for about 100 yards. They put up some points on them. But, you know, I'm I'm not ready to sit there and say, well, Michigan has turned it around, and Ohio State, by playing a little fast and loose with the ball against a top-10 team at Penn State, suddenly is, you know, this, 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 this paper champion flawed on so many levels. I'm, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it whatsoever. Are we going to possibly buy this, that there's concerns about Justin Fields' hand and just some of the nagging injuries he's been hit with in the last half of the season, uh, the lower back on a few <clears throat> hits. He he rolled the the lower portion of his <laughs> leg uh, on the one tackle and, again, the hand. And then J.K. Dobbins running the ball 36 times, although I think back to last year's Maryland game in which he was given the ball like 38 times prior to Michigan and that certainly didn't seem to hamper him against the Wolverines. Yeah, I think that uh, by and large, he's going to be okay. He's going to answer the bell. I think there was some concern as I rewatched that play that the defender who was on his back trying to go for the uh, loose ball that he had fumbled, um, their ankles, their legs got tangled up, and his ankle basically got bent uh, a way that it's not supposed to go. So I don't know if he was in – a little bit of a shock there, or perhaps he also landed on top of the ball and was just a little bit winded. Sometimes that can happen too. But uh, he was motionless there for about a minute, and uh, it got deathly quiet there at Ohio Stadium. And we all lived through something like that, uh, what would it have been five years ago with JT Barrett uh, this week, coming up five years ago on Friday. I'll have a story about uh, the Michigan game that was played and how uh, Barrett uh, broke his ankle. It was toward the end of the third quarter of that game against Michigan, and uh, they were able to press on and, and win the national championship without him. I don't think that uh, Ohio State fans are particularly excited about the chance of going forward without Justin Fields. Uh, he, uh, for all of his uh, many faults, which there aren't a lot of them, I say many, M-I-N-I, -I, not many, uh, faults. I think the one that kind of came to the forefront last week was holding the ball in the pocket, and staring too long. But if he does that instead of throwing a bad interception, I guess that's uh, uh, more acceptable. Uh, but uh, he's got to either make a decision, step up and, and, and throw or step up and go. And I think that's what uh, Coach Day's probably teaching him this week because I know at least one of the sacks seemed to me people were blaming Thayer Munford right after the holding penalty, and it seemed to me like Fields was in the pocket for four seconds. He's got to make a decision, and uh, the offensive line can't be expected to hold for much longer. And hold by that, I mean pass protect uh, for, for much longer than three or four seconds. I think at that point he's on his own. So uh, I think I think – uh, Day would like to see him trigger a little quicker uh, with whatever it is he's going to do uh, because the, the challenges are only going to get tougher as you go forward. I mean, you know, Michigan, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, whoever it may be, uh, Utah, Oklahoma, uh, Clemson, Alabama, whoever it is, Clemson in that semifinal, and then uh, LSU uh, in the championship. Uh, if that's how it all turns out, uh, there's going to be some people in there who are going to get in his face and create problems for him. Um, as I go back to the beginning, again, this is what it looks like when you play talent that is close to even. And I think Michigan's got talent that is, you know, if Ohio State's got fives and fours, Michigan's got a lot of maybe one five and a lot of fours and threes right here. It's not 
as terribly pronounced a difference as people would think it might be. But, uh, you know, Michigan's been number two to Ohio State's number one in all these recruiting uh, class updates for all these years. So um, I'm interested to see, again, what kind of heart both teams are going to display. What does this really mean to you? We talked to K.J. Hill about it. and He said, you know, I go back to last winter. And he said, no, I go back to when I first stepped on campus. And we're doing sit-ups and and push-ups in January and February with Michigan's name on them because that's what this means. It is a year-round, 365-day-a-year commitment to be on this one day better than that other team. And uh, that they live it, they breathe it, and uh, they go the extra effort uh, to, to put themselves in position uh, to uh, to do better on this one day. So uh, nothing that Michigan has tried in the last two decades has really had much sustained success against Ohio State. They beat the Buckeyes in 03. Uh, when Ohio State was the defending national champions, they'd already lost the game to Wisconsin. And then obviously uh, in 11, when Ohio State was in complete disarray uh, with Fickle as the uh, coach that season, it was um, uh, still a close game up there. But uh, Ohio State had chances to pull it out. But again, as I say, I don't sense or see any kind of change in how Michigan approaches Ohio State. And until that uh, – so that happens, I don't see much of a difference in the final result. Uh, before we cut you guys loose on the next aspect of this matchup, uh, I'll address the question on the screen from a Jinker GM. I love when people ask questions that they can go to Google for, but that's fine. I did it for them. The weather <laughs> forecast uh, in Ann Arbor on a Saturday is calling for a rain-snow mix of 80% certainty. Uh, very slight winds at 10 miles per hour, but a high of 41, which of course the game time's at noon. So it should hit that 41 around third quarter, I would think. So it's a pretty typical last of uh, November Ann Arbor day, gloomy and cold and dank and damp and rainy dire and dire and just dire. gloomy and awful, awful and kind of <laughs> overbearing and it makes you want to just kind of you know, kind of. so, so speaking of atmosphere, Steve, you lead me right into this. Uh, you guys have been on the field and in the press box and in the parking lots and the surrounding of the stadiums when it's, uh, Wisconsin or Penn state or Michigan state, and it's been a huge game or when it's been Texas out of conference or Oklahoma or somebody of that ilk, USC, Miami, how does this one just, just feel different when, when you approach game day and game time and getting to the the stadium yeah that's a great question i'm 51 and i've been to just about every one of these games uh with the exception of maybe four or five since the time i was 18 years old so it's probably around 30 30 games total and i what i would say to you <clears throat> is everybody going to this game <clears throat> knows that as they're walking to the game there's always anticipation because you are about to see something that is unrivaled in college sports and in, in maybe all of sports, the greatest rivalry in all of sports. And yeah, one team's dominated the other for this decade or that decade or whatever it may be. But over time, uh, this has been one of the most heated, well-played, best rivalries in uh, all of sports. And you can tell the anticipation. People are – on the sidewalk, walk into the game, and they got this look on their face that I'm going to something very special, something very different. This isn't Indiana. This isn't Purdue. This isn't uh, Army. This is Ohio State and Michigan. This is a big game I'm going to go see today. And that's kind of the atmosphere. Um, you know, it was weird. Ohio State had Penn State here this past week, and I was driving down to the stadium. You know, most times you drive right in, uh, park your car, two, two and a half, three hours before the game. This time there was pedestrian traffic everywhere because it was a major event. And so maybe double the number of people in the campus area from what is a normal game. And uh, that's kind of what it'll be, although for this one against Michigan, although I think if you're going to go to the trouble of being in the area for that game, you probably got a ticket and going in just because of uh, the weather situation and, and how difficult it's going to be. I can't imagine people are going to be out in the parking lot Huddled, huddled under a, a, one of those lean-tos and watching the game on television like this, but you, you never know. But uh, at any rate, 
it's a special event. It's a big time game, regardless of the stakes, regardless of who's favored. And uh, something interesting is going to happen one way or the other that you've never seen before. And uh, it could be something completely out of left field. Guys playing positions they've never played before. Uh, just different things just happen in this game because it truly is a one-game season. And it's better when, obviously, the Big Ten Eastern Division Championship's on the line, as it was in 2016, and uh, it means something and, and whatever. But uh, this time around, uh, we're going to find out whether or not Ohio State's uh, truly a national championship caliber team because if you truly are a national championship team and deserve to be in that mix, you don't mess up and lose this game. You, you don't, and uh, you don't get caught looking ahead to Minnesota or Wisconsin uh, because uh, of this game. This game is a season unto itself. It's unfortunate that they scheduled Penn State and Michigan back-to-back the way that they did, but those are the breaks. That's the way the schedule was written this year, and uh, I know that uh, there was a year, a year here recently where Michigan State was – the uh, game Ohio State played the week before it may have been in 2015, I think, when Ohio State lost to Michigan State and maybe one or two other times as well. And that makes it that much more difficult on Ohio State when they had good teams uh, to uh, to play uh, two great top 10 teams back to back weeks makes it much more difficult. So, uh, man, potential of three top 10 teams in back to back to back weeks. But uh, again, one day at a time. And uh, one play at a time, I think Ohio State's going to put their best foot forward on Saturday. Kevin, we were talking um, rivalries a few weeks ago prior to Florida State-Miami, and I had a, uh, I'll leave his name out of it, uh, a certain gentleman guest that was uh, claiming that Florida State-Miami had the greatest rivalry in college football. (laughs) And and I I almost, uh, you know, if I had the technology to actually come through the screen and strangle him, I would have done that just because it was so ludicrous. Uh, so I pointed to metrics because, it, you know, the, 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 the guttural reaction is, you know, everybody's rivalry is the most important to them. Obviously, if we travel out to Oregon, it's the Civil War. That's great. But they're not going to argue that it's a greater rivalry than Ohio State, Michigan, anybody that has any common sense. Uh, sure, Florida State, Miami in given years has been an important game with great NFL players all, all over the field. But when you take into consideration the prestige, the tradition, uh, just everything, and, and even if you just want to go the metrics, if you want to go the hard black and white numbers, there are not more people that sit in the stands to watch any other game or watch it on television. And I told this particular person, I said, go to a college football schedule on any given site, any website during the middle of May or June, before the season's even coming close to uh, kicking off. And you will find two games that are already scheduled. One is the Army-Navy game because it sits by itself and it's special for its own reasons. And the other one is already scheduled for noon on a major network. It's already Fox or the previous contract ABC, and it's Ohio State-Michigan because they know, regardless of what the records are, that's the number one game we want to show, and it's going to have the highest regular season ratings of any college football game, even when the teams aren't even that great or playing for a championship. And he then pointed to me, and I'll let you cut loose after this, to the 2006 Florida State Miami game, which I'm sure nobody outside of Florida State Miami remembers. But anyway, the 06 game for some reason, because it was the highest rated game on ESPN to date in its history. And so I had to to um, school him on this. So I looked it up. OK, yes. At that point, it was the highest rated game on ESPN with a 6.9 rating. And then I said, what do you think the Ohio State Michigan game did in 2006? How about a 13 rating. I've got it right on the laptop, right in front of me. There is no comparison between the two. When you talk national rivalries, when you talk significance, historically, uh, yes, in pockets, Notre Dame, USC, Auburn, Alabama, whatever. uh, I think there are other rivalries that um, certainly can stake their claim, but uh, I will go to the metrics and I will go anecdotal. Uh, I was in the South covering the SEC for six years And anytime I talked rivalry with anybody, not knowing what my allegiance was, if they talk to their rivalry, of course, everybody's going to talk their state or regional rivalry first. Then the first one they brought up, Ohio State, Michigan. Yeah, I mean, Ohio State, Michigan will do a 90 share in Columbus and like a like a a 70 share in Cleveland and, you know, whatever it's going to do in Detroit. And I guarantee you, Florida State, Miami is not going to do nearly those types of shares in either of those markets 
I understand the Miami market's a little different, so you know, I'm gonna I'll I'll I'll, I'll take that under consideration. But you know, Florida State Miami is being a top rivalry. It would it, I it wouldn't even make my top five, maybe maybe even my top ten, to be quite honest. I mean, there were some years that it was great. But Ohio State and Michigan is special. I mean, it really is. And, you know, I'm not going to get into the great debate of where we open it to all sports. And, you know, there's a certain four-letter network out there that wants to tell you that Yankees Red Sox is like the biggest thing in the world. And if you don't believe it, they'll just run 50 promos to remind you of it. Um, you know, I, I grew up in Southern California. Dodgers Yankees was always a big thing for me. But Ohio State Michigan has the documentaries, has, you know, the viewers, has the merchandise, has the history, has the the, the, the great figures through it. It's always going to be the number one rivalry out there. And it's what makes us so, it makes this week so special. I mean, it, it really does. And I've never had an opportunity to really witness it from the other side. That's just the way that rivalries generally work. Um, but, you know, I know coming from the Ohio State side that it, it always means something. I mean, I have great fond memories as an undergraduate marching through campus with Phantom Band and jumping in Mirror Lake when that was still a thing. And a couple of other traditions that kind of got discontinued because there was a little too much vandalism along the way. But it was always a great time. What do you say, Steve? Uh, ranking rivalries. Uh, difficult to do, of course. Uh, you can go the visceral route of the emotion and so forth and everybody can stake their claim but then you've got just hard cold facts when it comes to popularity across the nation and this one again even when the teams are down or one of them's down uh, it still holds uh, national attention definitely i think auburn alabama is probably in that mix just because of what a lot of those games have meant over the years oklahoma texas is probably uh, somewhere in that top five or ten as well, um, Florida, Georgia, maybe as well. Um, but again, you you look at uh, at what Ohio State and Michigan has meant for the sport, what it has meant for the Big Ten, uh, and just overall. I mean, just the uh, interest and the excitement that are generated. Um, I mean, it is the peg that kind of props up a lot of what goes on and what happens around the Big Ten. So to me, uh, you can't say enough about this. And, uh, you know, you just think about the great coaches, the great players, the great moments. Uh, you know, uh, this is the 116th edition, I believe, of this uh, great rivalry. And uh, typically, I mean, it's two top ten teams uh, fighting it out. And, and depending on where the – playoff committee puts Michigan this week. Uh, in some regards, it'll be considered top 10. AP has them, I think, 10 or 9 or whatever. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting uh, to see uh, how, how, how those rankings will be uh, shaken out this week. And uh, yet, uh, to me, um, you know, a rivalry is something that, that just year after year, it's handed down, grandparent to grandson, you know, uh, dad, down to his daughters and you know just it's it's something that just uh it's thanksgiving time and this is something that families either the games at ohio state and everyone's going to the game or they're going to go tailgate or it's uh, the weekend after thanksgiving and the games in michigan and they're all gonna uh, rally around the tv set and the, have the fire roaring and uh, eat the leftover turkey and, and watch the buckeyes uh play michigan it, it really doesn't get any better than this time of year with, uh, you know, again, great family traditions and, uh, again, what this game means to the entire state of Ohio. I can't speak to what it means in Michigan. I mean, they have their Notre Dame rivalry, although that's kind of come to an end right now again. And then uh, their annual game with Michigan State is, uh, you know, their big in-state thing, and, and they love uh, going back and forth with Sparty. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, to be the best in football, they're going to have to figure out a way – to, uh, to solve Ohio State. And again, a lot of it is determined on signing day. The material that goes in is the result that comes out eight times or nine times out of ten. And Ohio State's putting better material into the blender and getting a better concoction coming out the other side than Michigan is just because, as we said, four and five stars are going to beat three and four stars most days if uh, everything's equal. Patterson, by the way, uh, going to Ole Miss, he was a national top two or three quarterback the year that he signed with Ole Miss. And so for him to play 
at whatever level this is we're going to determine, as Kevin said, this was Michigan State and Indiana he beat up on. This wasn't Wisconsin and uh, uh, you know some of the other top defenses that are out there. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. But uh, he was considered at one time a blue chip five-star player. And, uh, you know, maybe he's got that in him to, to will them to a big win. I, I kind of think that uh, the guy on the other side who Ryan Day termed as a, quote, warrior, uh, Justin Fields, has that look about him that uh, he's going to bring, you know, glory and championship to Ohio State, maybe two years of it. Uh, here this year and next year. So uh, to me, you get wrapped up in this thing that you could talk storylines and history and everything for for days. But uh, really, when they get between the lines, it's usually a good, clean football game, hard hitting. And uh, the better team uh, may not always win, but it's usually a pretty entertaining game. Uh, that four for 13 uh, effort that Justin Fields put out there in uh, the spring game seems to be long since forgotten by all those people that were concerned about <laughs> 33 touchdowns, one interception. <laughs> uh, Elijah Mahone, we appreciate the super chat contribution. And he's certainly pointing out, I think a point that all of us made in regards to the Michigan Renaissance and offense that we've seen over the past month. We'll see if they can do it against an elite defense. What, if a gun was held to my head, I would call the best defense in America. I'll make maybe a, a, an altered judgment on that in the next two weeks. We'll see once they face Michigan slash uh, Wisconsin or Minnesota. Uh, NBA fan brings up a comment concerning Justin Fields and the usage of him in the running game going to next year. But uh, let's keep it to this year uh, because this is a point in this game. Uh, that is rather crucial because Justin Fields' ability to run the ball certainly threatens the defense and brings a whole new dynamic. But there's the thought of how much do we protect him? How much do we balance that, Kevin, in regards to the game plan? But, man, we, we've got to win this game, or it is Michigan. We think we've got to win this game. But going forward, uh, protecting Justin Fields versus uh, unleashing him as a playmaker. Well, I mean, you got to win the game. You play to win the game. I've heard that before somewhere. Uh, I don't think that you can sit there and I mean, it's it, 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 it's OK to, you know, during the Indiana's and the Maryland's of the season, really try and, you know, keep him in the bubble wrap and not do that. But when it comes to playing these big games, you, 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 what are you saving him for? I mean, I understand mathematically they're already locked into the Big Ten championship game. Yeah, they could probably drop this game, and as long as they win in the championship game, still make it into the playoff. But do you also want to do that without giving everything your best shot? You know, I just I have a hard time with that. So I think that you still run him. I don't think you go out there and overrun him. I don't think you just sit there and say, well, we're going to – we're really going to just make this a Justin Fields on, on the ground type of game. I mean, I think you still have to stay within – what you what it is that you do well offensively in in your game plan i don't think that uh, you want to veer too much away from that but you you can't sit there and be playing with the parking brake halfway on that just, your the car isn't going to go anywhere when you do that yes yeah, steve in regards to justin fields being used on the ground uh we saw him get nicked up against penn state against wisconsin and some other teams but uh it's just a total different dynamic and and he obviously converted some huge third downs and fourth and five with his legs because he's electric yeah no question about it uh the fourth down play uh was pretty amazing it was fourth and five and they went empty and i i know kevin was sitting up there by us and i think the the um consensus from all of us up in the peanut gallery was to expect the quarterback draw and that's exactly what happened as josh myers came off the ball and hit the middle linebacker and sprung Fields for a big play, and that's just an example of what he can do. Uh, there were a couple of the plays that uh, during the course of the game, people were questioning some of the play calling and different things like that that came up. But on the whole, uh, they did the best they could. And again, I, I go back, you know, Ohio State fans are spoiled. This is what it looks like when you play what I thought was a quality defense in Penn State. Uh, no one's really taken that defense to the woodshed this year. Michigan had 28 against them. Ohio State had 28 against them. So I don't know. Uh, to me, uh, he is a guy in a game, as we say, when talent is equated, who's going to have to step up to the forefront. And that may be the case again this week. Could be the case in every game going forward. And we're going to find out just how tough he truly is. 21 carries seems like a bit much for him. I think the sweet spot for him would be around 
10, kind of like what we used to say with uh, Barrett and uh, with Haskins, it was like five, but <laughs> that was not his, uh, not his area that running the football, unless it was Maryland that he had to beat Maryland. <laughs> but at any, I'm cracking myself up just thinking about how they, he discovered in one day, I'm a runner. <laughs> so, cause the game meant more to him that day. But uh, at any rate, uh, I just think with fields, it's been precaution. And uh, even last week they got slammed at the goal line at Rutgers and day came right out and said, well, uh, we handed the ball off there because uh, we didn't want to run Justin in that situation. Had it to do over again, as we saw against uh, Penn State. Justin did keep it on the goal line. You know, got, he got hit and fumbled at the uh, six inches just outside the goal line. The ball came out. It was pretty clear on replay that it was out before he crossed the, the uh, goal line. But he is a weapon down in that red zone and provided he hangs on to the football. And uh, so you're going to see all hands on deck and uh, use all weapons available because if you don't, you run the risk of not winning one of these games and, and not advancing and not winning the national championship. You want to give yourself the best opportunity possible. One of the reporters after the game the other day asked if they had – I'm getting just shaking, thinking if they had kept stuff back – and I'm like, keep stuff back. You don't win this game. There's no Big Ten. There's no playoff. I mean, do you put them in at 11-1 maybe? I, I know they got in at 11-1 one year, but hold stuff back. This was the season to me was last week. So, um, yeah, I, I agree. I think Fields is fair game. Put him out there. Use him however you need to use him. I mean, let's don't get crazy about it, but at the same time, there's nothing to be held back at this point of the year. Yeah, it's Ohio State and Michigan. And uh, if you grew up in either one of these states or you pay attention to college football on any level, you know what this means. Uh, you have a glimpse into what it means. And I love rivalry week in college football. I just think it distinguishes. It's one of the distinguishing factors of this sport versus all the other sports. Somebody had commented in the live chat that the Bears Packers was the greatest rivalry in sports, uh, which, of course, we, we do realize that there are Packers that then a few years later play for the Bears and then they go back and they might play for the Cowboys or the Chiefs or somebody else. That's what's great about college sports. And, and obviously this is deteriorating because of the transfer portal to a certain extent, but it still holds true in about 98 to 99% of the cases that when you're a Buckeye, you're a Buckeye, you're a Buckeye for life. If you're a Wolverine, you're a Wolverine for life. And years and decades later, they're going to be associated with that team and that program. And there's not going to be have to have to be any kind of argument as to whether uh, were they an Ohio State player or an Oklahoma player or this or that. Um, it, it means uh, so much more at the college level, I think, because of that one thing. And there's just something special about college football and the pageantry and the limited number of games. And um, just, um, hey, you got to be around the sport to, to, to realize uh, the special and unique aspect of it um, and, and what this game brings. It's just uh, <clears throat> just special. That's all there is to it. All right, gentlemen, uh, unless there's anything else that we can carve up here, I would uh, point everyone to go to Bucknuts and also go to uh, Buckeye Grove to check out Steve Hillwagon and Kevin Noon's work. They both do an exceptional job of covering Ohio State athletics and football in particular. And of course, this is the week to dive in and do the deep dive with Ohio State and Michigan and the Buckeyes with the top 10 basketball team as well here at mark rogers tv the voice of college football we heard from the michigan side i uh encourage you to check out that video buckeye fans there was uh, some stories on earl bruce and woody case even though it was a michigan slant to it uh and uh we've had a whole lot of fun talking rivalries all week but this is the creme de la creme ohio state in michigan but we will hit all the major ones as well Gentlemen, if you've got a prediction for us, I would love to hear it. I will let everyone know that you can get my pick in the description section below of any of the videos, the links at Voice of College Football Community. I was 11-6 and six against the spread last week, so sometimes we have some decent weeks in trying to pick these college football games, but I will give my shot at Ohio State, Michigan, both straight up and against a what I hear is a nine-point spread. So, Kevin, uh, either point as to where we can find your uh, prediction or certainly we'll take it right now. 
I'm I'm still kind of working on my number, but I've got yeah. one. I've got one that I have down for now. It could change between now and the game, but you know, I I just think that Ohio State knows how to win in this game, and Michigan hasn't been able to figure out how to break through. I think that uh, Ohio State's going to be able, like it did against Wisconsin, like it did against Michigan State, like it did against Penn State, is going to be able to solve the run defense they're going against. I look, I see Ohio State running for about two fifty in this game. Michigan's going to do what they can to try and force Justin Fields to beat him, and he is. And Ohio State's going to win somewhere in the neighborhood of 35-23. Yep, I would uh, I would kind of echo what he was saying. I think Michigan's going to try and uh, contain um, J.K. Dobbins, Ohio State's running game. They have another team this week that's, uh, again, outstanding defensively, and Ohio State's going to be on coming to them to uh, – Establish the run and take some of the heat off Justin Fields. Uh, his wide receivers have been outstanding, though. K.J. Hill and Chris Olave both made great catches for touchdowns last week. Good to see Austin Mack kind of getting his feet uh, back in the uh, – getting his feet wet again and getting back in there. Garrett Wilson played well. Benjamin Victor played well. So all five of those guys are, are geared up and ready to go in the right direction. That means uh, big things. I think Ohio State is healthy finally. Uh, don't have anybody who's expected to miss. Baron Browning was back, making an impact uh, this past uh, game at linebacker. Damon Arnett was back at cornerback. Michigan's got uh, three pretty good receivers with Bell, Collins, and Peoples-Jones. Ohio State, <coughs> excuse me, counters with Okuda, Wade, and Arnett at cornerback. So that's going to be a great uh, battle in of itself. And can they protect uh, Shea Patterson? Chase Young, uh, the the comment I made, the, he's going to be uh, shot out shot out like shot out of there like a cannon or something like that last week. And uh, that's exactly what it was. More the second half. He just had a huge second half. A couple of the sacks came in the second half and uh, really made his presence felt uh, – in the course of that game, and the Buckeyes were able to hold off Penn State. We'll see if they can uh, do the same. I'm thinking along the lines I wrote down 31 to 20, something like that. But uh, it could get a little bit more aggressive. I don't know. I don't. Other than Ohio State turning it over three or four times, I'm not sure uh, that Michigan, as Kevin alluded to earlier, is going to be able to establish the run against Ohio State's great defense. And if they can't do that, and they have to put everything on uh, Patterson. And uh, the Buckeyes are able to disguise some of their uh, coverages, blitzes, and pass rush schemes, then uh, he might be in for a long day. So I don't know. I, I, I just think it's going to be a, another great game. Uh, Ohio State fans, get ready. It may not be pretty. It may not be 44-3 uh, to 3 like you guys had the first 10 weeks. But, uh, again, uh, this is what competitive football looks like. You better get used to it because, uh, you know, as easy as the first eight or ten games were, that's how hard these last four or five games are going to be. Yeah. Uh, Rod Farva asked the question about Michigan's perception nationally if they lose this game and how it will change. I don't think it changes at all. No, unchanged. They, still, they go nine still can't three. get it done. I mean, been. That, that, that national perception has been there for a while. There's no, no. change about they, it. They, they the need national, to win the game to change the national perception. The they national perception. The yes, yeah. Steve. The national perception is preseason, top seven or eight. <laughs> Postseason, 20 to 25. I mean, that's just how it is every year. A little bit better every, than that, every, Steve. <laughs> Wash, rinse. That, are, are you serious? When they lose the bowl game last year, what they I mean they got killed. What'd they end up? Were they uh, even they, in the top they 20 in the at the top end? 15 last year. Okay, yeah, you were you're you're, you're probably right. they finished high. They finished in the top 10 in 2016. Yeah. Well, a lot of years they're eight and four. And absolutely. And yeah, over the last 15 years, certainly there are I, I I do say Harbaugh's got them closer to nine or ten most years. So whatever. And I don't mean it in a flippant manner. I mean, I'm talking to you the same way that people talked about Ohio State very frank terms, could get to the finish line but could not cross it. And that's how it was in the 90s. Anybody, my son, you know, who's a third year at Ohio State takes all this for granted, that it's it, this is how it's preordained by guard, that Ohio State dominates Michigan year in and year out. It's not like that. You have to go out and do it. You have to go out and make it happen. And one of these years, Michigan is going to slip up and win this game. I don't know if it's going to be this Saturday. could be next year, the following year. Sometime in the next five or ten years, they're going to win one of these games. So I guess we'll have to 
wait and see when that happens. But um, uh, again, get let's get to the stadium on Saturday and see what unfolds. My son is 23 years old, and he tells me all the time, Dad, I see the opens to the game every year and the 1970s and all the great things that happen. And I see I see all that, and I hear you preaching to me since I was five years old about how special this is, and it's unlike anything else. But to me, it's been Wisconsin and Michigan State have been our rivals. Those have been our rivals. It's not been Michigan. Yeah. Uh, but that's been his lifetime and what he's seen over the past 15 years uh, with the Buckeyes and the Wolverines. Uh, I will say this. I haven't made a score prediction yet, and that'll be available later, but I will say this. I do not expect Michigan to lay an egg as they did last year as, on paper, the arguably the better team going into the game based on the results. Uh, the, the one defense I'll make of Harbaugh is, yes, Michigan has not shown up for this game generally, but the 2016 game could have been called either way, obviously, on the ball placement, and that would have completely turned that season around for them. Uh, the other thing I will say is, yes, I don't I don't expect the way I'm leaning. Ohio State's a better team. They're an elite team. They're probably the best team in the country. Oh, uh, Michigan's going to show up with a top 10 team. And if they both play to their levels, with, whether that's an A game versus an A game or a C versus a C, then Michigan, I think, is going to play lights out and give it their best shot. But Ohio State's just too damn talented and too good for them. And that's probably what it's going to come down to. And what they showed us last week against Penn State is that they've got some guts as well. But I am impressed with Michigan's resiliency. They could have laid down against Penn State when they got down 21 nothing. Then after they battled all the way back to get within a drop pass of winning the game to be resilient enough to come back the next week with nothing on the line and beat Notre Dame as they did, I think they've shown us something of what I consider to be a mentally weak team when I watched them in Madison get blown up away and bullied by Wisconsin, uh, that they are ready for the challenge to a certain extent. Uh, So I don't think Michigan's going to lose the game. I'm just leaning toward Ohio State just being just freaking too good uh, to drop this one. All right, gentlemen, it's always a pleasure. You guys just uh, do a tremendous job each and every week for us uh, breaking down Ohio State football. So again, it's Kevin Noon at Buckeye Grove. So I encourage you to get there and also Steve Hellwagon at Bucknuts, and Steve has done uh, a great job, and just I appreciate him so much in posting these videos to Bucknuts. Uh, you guys, enjoy the game. Uh, hopefully the weather holds to a certain extent for you so you're not getting wet in and outside the stadium, and uh, you enjoy the, uh, the game, and hopefully you run into some decent Michigan fans that treat you pretty well. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure to happen. We will see you guys next time. I'm going to run through the live chat real quick just uh, in case I have missed uh, some some comments that need to be responded to. But I uh, appreciate you guys jumping on board, and uh, we will talk to you next week. All right. Take care. All right. Uh, sifting through the live chat, just want to make sure I'm about uh, 15 minutes behind. Just want to make sure that I don't miss anything that's uh, worth responding to. I uh, certainly appreciate everybody's comments. Uh, NBA fan asking, do you guys think that a combination of Tyreek Smith, Jonathan Cooper, and Zach Harrison, along with the other edge rushers, along with a healthy uh, Teron Vincent? Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. A better overall D-line, and that's been Ohio State's best recruited uh, positional unit. That's all there is to it. And even without Chase Young, that's despite him being on a whole other level, Obviously, Ohio State has been able to absorb that loss, and and obviously they were playing the two worst teams on their schedule, basically, in Rutgers and Maryland. But uh, the way that Ohio State is recruited has only been on par with Clemson at that position over the last several years. So uh, let's see what else we've got here. Mm -hmm Mm-hmm. And uh, I just encourage all of you to keep it locked in here. Uh, We're covering all the major rivalries. I have talked uh, nonstop over the last two afternoons with all sorts of bloggers and broadcasters uh, as we cover all the rivalries. Uh, Yes, Todd, uh, encouraging everyone to hit the like button. So this is paramount. Please, if you love what we do here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, as we dissect and uh, break down the game that we all love each and every day, even if you don't agree with me, if you like what we do here, please hit the like button and uh, share the videos out there on social media because uh, if it gets us in the suggested videos column of YouTube, that is key. Uh, And that's going to keep us around doing this and that's going to sustain this channel. Otherwise, it's difficult to sustain this uh, pace uh, each and every day. Uh, Cheryl, 
your uh, support is tremendous. Thank you so much for all that you do and supporting us in all the live streams. Cheryl shows up for all of them. It's amazing, as uh, some of you uh, other ones do as well. So I don't want to discount anyone. And I'm going to have a big party of sorts or a big uh, shout out party uh, we need to do during the off season to recognize Cheryl Iron Cross Clemson alum. I'm just looking at the screen right now. Todd and Navy Thomas and NCIS Fanatic 21. And I could name a hundred other people at least. And, and it's it's encouraging to see so many people that have just instantly been uh, become tremendous contributors to our channel uh, through their likes and their comments. And then I'm like, uh, where did you come from? And they're like, oh, I've only been watching for five days, but they just dive right in and uh, they're commenting and contributing and supporting me and uh, leaving uh, encouraging comments. So I appreciate that. Anything else on the line that I need to hit? There's Navy Thomas. Uh, Mark Thibodeau, thanks for joining us. NBA fan, of course, thank you so much for the many comments uh, that you brought to the table. Uh, and so many others, again, cannot thank you guys enough. James Warner's on the line. He loves the Buckeyes. Ray Davis, I don't know that I've seen your handle before. Welcome to Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. And on and on and on and on. And I believe we've hit the end of the line. Uh, we appreciate it very much. My daughter's headed to town, so I will enjoy spending some time with her and providing more college football content. During Rivalry Week, we'll see you soon.